Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from $100,000 and beyond, and beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host, Tyson Bettino, and on today's episode, we have Joshua Flannery. He is the CEO of Innovation Dojo. And if you are a foreigner based in Japan, in the startup world, you will have come across Joshua several or many times. He is extremely active in helping startups enter the Japanese market and also helping governments and universities with their startup and innovation programs. He knows more about the Japan ecosystem than I do. And I look forward to learning from him about the Japan startup scene and how in previous episodes, we've covered startup cities, incubators, communities, but we're going to have everything wrapped up in one episode with the man, the expert, Joshua Flannery. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you for that flattering and maybe uh, going a little bit too far with the uh, nice intro there, but I really appreciate that, Tyson. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Tyson mentioned, I'm Joshua Flannery. Most people call me Josh. I am based in the north part of Osaka, but uh, quite active across Kobe, Osaka, Kyoto, and increasingly more in Tokyo too. Basically, I am an Australian who's had a, a really long relationship with Japan ever since I、um, accidentally started working in Sydney City's very first Kaiten Sushi Train restaurant and being, <laughs> the, being the only non、uh, Japanese staff back in 1997. But since then, I've lived in Japan for three different stints. And basically, across different parts of my career, beginning with, I guess, in the mid 2000s, when I was essentially a startup entrepreneur working for、uh, an ed tech company, which I brought into Japan back、mm. then in、uh, 2005. And later on, I spent a lot of time working, designing, and managing programs,、uh, incubators, accelerators. Including on university campus in Australia, later working for I think what is still the largest kind of startup hub in the Southern Hemisphere, Sydney Startup Hub. And then moving back to Japan again just before Corona hit, bringing in、uh, Rainmaking Innovation and their startup bootcamp, Scale Osaka Accelerator,、uh, mm -hmm. before focusing on Innovation Dojo these last few years. So, yeah, that's, that's me. Excellent. And I do follow you on LinkedIn, and、uh, I know I've seen the team、uh, grow.、Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, a,、yes. it's an exciting time. <laughs> cool. So I think we'll dive into, we'll start maybe at the idea stage, but、uh, could you tell us a little bit about incubators and maybe what they offer and maybe some examples? Yeah. So. I think that there's a bit of a distinction between like the classic incubator definition as they first kind of were thought of, probably in the US or the West, and then how they've evolved. Really simply, like an early stage startup, or、uh, I guess a startup in general, sits in what used to be a, a physical space. It's not always that now.、Uh, rather than have kind of intense programming and sort of, you know,、uh, leading up to a particular event, it's more like where the startup lives.、Mm -hmm. and, and the particular environment is conducive to helping that startup grow over time. Helping with access to all the things that startups classically need in the early phase. So, it might be help with growing the startup. So, a lot of incubators would have an entrepreneur in residence or some kind of access to mentors, but not necessarily you have to turn up on at this day, at this time. It's the biggest distinction, I think, is its needs based support. And that's where I think it's different from accelerators, which I think we'll touch on next. So, for example, like I would say as a category, incubators are usually managed by a different category that has an incubator as a part of what it offers. So, it might be a VC fund 
and they're effectively incubating startups mm. that they have invested in. So I, I believe, for example, in, in Tokyo, DNX Ventures, they have a spot within a, a co-working space and they have most of of their portfolio companies, assuming they're still at that right size, living there. And they're offering support, connections, access to maybe pathways to talent acquisition and looking at whether they're ready for follow-on funding and other sort of business development support. Um, so I, I guess it's more like an environment. And there are online versions of incubators too. So for example, we did a project 2021-22 with Kobe City Government, which was called Kobe Startup Hub. Uh -huh. now, that um, was interesting because it was both for domestic Japanese startups and foreign inbound startups. And I think the part that we did for the domestic Japan-based startups was very similar to what an incubator does in that on demand, we would be available, uh, we'd listen to the needs, and depending on those needs, we'd plug them into either someone to mentor them or a potential partner or a potential customer or a potential um, investor, that kind of thing. As um, that startup sort of grew, there'd be different needs. So yeah, I guess that would be how I kind of summarize incubators. It's not like uh, a program, it's more like where you live as a startup and and kind of environment around you has most of the useful, valuable things that you might need help with or someone who can connect you to them. Yeah, that would be cool just having everyone in one spot. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like being in university again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, yeah, And yeah, I think you mentioned like the online ones. I've seen, I think it, uh, life. this one's in English, but I think Lifetime Ventures and Antler, I think it started one. They'll help you get the idea float. And if you're one of the chosen ones, you could get some potential funding. Right. Yeah, that's right. So I, I, I think, yeah, they're either attached to a fund or they could be kind of blended with like what a co-working space offers. So a, an example local to me, there's a space called Anchor Kobe, and that is in the downtown area of Kobe City. It's actually a membership co-working space, but they have put in pro sort of services that simulate what an incubator does. So they have uh, entrepreneurs in residence. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, offer connections at, to, to different parts of the ecosystem. And they have kind of community managers, which are facilitating essentially what an incubator would do. So, yeah, I, I think it isn't so much that there is like this organization category of incubator that's really standing alone. It's more that there are a bunch of organizations that are offering incubation. And that's kind of what it seems to have evolved to. Ooh, and let's move on to accelerators. Yeah. So accelerators too, I think, mean different things to different people. So like the classic kind of Silicon Valley accelerator, kind of uh, Y Combinator or Techstars, although they differ in sort of styles to some extent, essentially, you know, they're all about taking a, a startup, the founder through a, you know, it could be 12 week in the classic style, or it could be longer or shorter than that, getting to the point where they grow so rapidly and they measure their growth so that they become, I guess, the most optimal investable vehicle by the end of the program. And that's why there's always these demo days, which classically were, um, you know, to put on the show for the potential investors and sort of attract the next batch at the same time. So there are uh, examples of this in Japan. I think, you know, actually like lesser known is that domestic accelerators have been going on way before the ecosystem started to globalize. So like organizations like Docomo and TT and others, they've been running sort of domestic accelerator programs for years and years, uh, even before any of this kind of inbound accelerator category existed. And that was that sort of classic view, you know, let's grow the, our investments as quick as possible about mentors and investment. But fast forward to say 2018, 2019, 
the word accelerator started to be used by this new category, which was, I guess, spearheaded by like the likes of plug and play or 500 startups or other sort of domestic players that started offering inbound programming like Zero One Booster or particular themed programs like for the maker movement related tech monoscuri ventures. Oh, yes. There's a whole kind of range of them. But I think the main difference between new category, or it's not new anymore, but the, the more recent category of accelerator that gets a lot of attention now is they're designed really as market entry vehicles for startups that are likely to have something to add value to domestic corporates or, or investors or the ecosystems in general. An example like 2019, I was running on behalf of the, the European mm. innovation company Rainmaking. I was running the first and second cohorts of the startup bootcamp scale Osaka program. Ah, yes, I've heard of it. Yeah. And so that essentially was on behalf of a consortium of seven large corporations. So some of the big railway conglomerates like oh, I gotcha. <laughs> Hankyu Hanshin or JR West or, uh, you know, SMBC, the bank, there were several others basically going through a process of understanding what that corporate wants in terms of acquiring partnerships or technology or access to new capabilities that a startup could potentially provide. And then going out around the world and mm -hmm. scouting for the best of the best startups um, that A, fit that category need, but B, have some kind of interest in expanding to Japan or, or Asia in general. And then uh, attracting those startups to apply and then going through the process of what we call this kind of inbound accelerator. And for that particular program, it actually, once you lift up the bonnet and have a look what's happening week to week, it's very, very different to that kind of original mm. Y Combinator tech stars style because um, it's very much pointedly focused on designing and executing proof of concept projects between the Japanese corporate sponsor and foreign startups that are participating. I would say everyone, there's probably the, the best explanation I've ever heard of accelerators <laughs> in Japan. <laughs> it is perfect. Uh, please continue. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think to imagine like what that means, so, you know, going through a proof of concept, imagine over 12 weeks, you as a startup founder at the beginning, um, agreeing on what you and your Japanese partner will build out over the program and like literally signing the agreement. Okay, this is what we're going to build together. And over the next, uh, you know, weeks, months, literally every week, working as a team to um, collaborate on building this version of your existing product that suits Japan and suits this first potential customer. And at the end, the demo day is maybe structured similar to the classic accelerator demo day, but instead of sort of saying, look how much we grew and thanking particular mentors for tips on how they you know, went from zero to whatever it is, it's showing what they built together. So for example, we had a company uh, called Mapsus from Hong Kong that built out a internal building version of Google Maps for JR station. You know, JR and Hankyu uh, have a train station that that would be really useful for. So they built it out and they presented that in the demo day. And so I think this kind of accelerator plays a critical function, uh, as do POCs or proof of concepts in general. And that is giving the startup their first Japan story. And that's something that the more you kind of try to do business development and sales in Japan, the most frequently asked question is, A, like, who have you already worked with and show me a detailed case study? And B, yeah, but who did you do that with in Japan? And so it's kind of this chicken and yes, egg. Yes, it is. Uh, with my experience with 500 Global and the Market Entry Accelerator, it's 
that happens all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, I, I guess like from a startup founder perspective, accelerators are becoming a kind of well-trodden path now. Getting that first brand that's Japanese that you can put on your marketing or, or sales material and say, look, we've worked with a Japanese company, we've executed something, and now we want to scale up or now we want to do this with different kinds of partners around the country. And that, that kind of gives you this credibility, which takes so much of the perceived risk out mm -hmm. of the, the, the other uh, side of the table's uh, perception that it really does accelerate your... Yeah, yeah I would agree too, because if you don't have that one use case, like finding the sales distributor is going to be hard. Yeah. And your, your salesman is going to have a really hard time. They're, they're going to have to be knocking on a lot doors. So you have to spend so much money just to kind of uh, get established. But that programs can help you establish totally. a foothold. Yeah. One of the common challenges I see with my consulting clients is not having any staff internally who can drive marketing strategy and execution to the next level. This really limits the growth trajectory of a company, especially for a leader like you that wants to go from 30 million to 500 million yen a year and does not have the time to spend years learning through trial and error. To solve this problem, I'm launching a marketing agency that can help companies like yours to increase leads and closing rates through SEO, Google Maps, content marketing, and websites that convert. Head over to scalingyourcompany.com and book a free consultation. Let's talk about what your business needs are, where your current strategy is letting you down, and how we can help you see real results with the methods I've successfully implemented at multiple companies myself. Now, back to the episode. So who typically sponsors these accelerators? Yeah. And why do they do it? So there are a bit of a variety of sponsor categories, but the biggest category, I think, is corporate Japan, whether it's a, a single corporate that is running its own program. For example, some of the big telcos or banks, or like I said before, railway conglomerates, even trading companies too. They come out with their own version of like an inbound startup accelerator. And the reasons they do it are multiple. And I, I would say they, they range from, let's say, less deep or reasons less directly connected to their commercial goals. Mm. So, you know, uh, to be skeptical about that side of things, I have this phrase, the POC festival in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's not POC hell, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So there are, I think, there is a marketing element to doing this and just jumping on trend without necessarily having a true commitment to working with startups beyond the, the program itself. And then as you sort of move up toward the more kind of reasons to do it closer to the core business of the sponsor, it can be seen as a step before technology procurement. A great outcome could be you do a POC, you hit all the agreed KPIs, then that continues on to a commercial arrangement where you become the service provider to the corporate that you initially did this POC with. In some cases, that might lead to the corporation investing either via its corporate venture capital arm or a strategic investment from the uh, core business. Or, you know, it might be a partnership. And I think I'm going into a bit of a rabbit hole with the, the corporate strategy stuff. It might be like that corporate could be almost a sales channel to the rest of the market as well. So you have cases where they might to you seem like an obvious customer, but for them, they want to incorporate your services and offer it themselves under their brand. And that can be a, a really interesting model and way to accelerate your expansion across Japan in partnership with a more known local brand. What are some examples of the corporate ones? I'll give you an example. Maybe I shouldn't mention names. I'm not sure if I should, but so that there was a program I was involved with and one of the corporation sponsors was a advertising agency. 
And that advertising agency offered a whole lot of digital services beyond just advertising. And they were actually looking for new services, new products, uh, new capabilities that they could sell into their existing client Mm -hmm. base. And so they wanted to work with a SaaS provider. Actually, it was a, um, a point of sale related technology provider. In that case, they did a POC rather than it being just a two-party proof of concept. It was the agency bringing a subset of its customers and together approaching those customers with the foreign startup as something they're jointly offering. Yeah. Very cool. And I think let's move on to uh, startup cities. Right. You've done a great job at getting a lot of the startup city players on your uh, on your podcast already. So I, I'm not sure how much new content I can offer here, but from my view, so this kind of phrase, startup cities, was something kind of brought about from a national government initiative mm-hmm. that to me, it was trying to solve the problem of giving a more focused direction for potential inbound startups when they're looking at coming into Japan. And so back in, it could have been 2019, 2020, um, the, the government kind of put out this call for proposals to all of the cities in Japan. And a lot of them started making campaigns to, to basically pitch to become what later became branded as the official startup cities of Japan. I was a little bit involved in that for the Osaka side. Really kind of interestingly, Osaka, Kyoto and Kobe agreed to make a joint proposal. Mm. And this was somewhat a surprise as until then they had been kind of competing more than collaborating. (laughs) Um, And they went ahead and made this joint kind of campaign. And long story short, they were selected as one of, you know, probably initially four or five particular geographies. And then later there were a few other I wouldn't say second tier, but other cities incorporated. So, you know, there was obviously Tokyo and I think that incorporated Yokohama as well, Mm -hmm. and maybe even Scuba to some extent. And then there was Kansai uh, with with Kyoto, Osaka, and Kobe. And then, of course, Central Japan, where Toyota is in Aichi with Nagoya. And then, you know, Fukuoka who are doing uh, really interesting things with their close proximity to some of the Asian countries there. And then later on, I guess, unique cities like Sapporo and I think Kitakyushu and and, uh, Sendai. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some apologies in advance to cities I haven't mentioned, but they all sort of became recognized as having a particular strong value proposition for startups coming in. And off the back of that, all of those cities received particular little buckets of funding to set up different initiatives. I think uh, you've spoken to uh, a lot of the players, if not all already, with the kind of inbound support programs that have been set up. So, you know, everything from the, the founder startup visas through to kind of, I suppose, almost like incubation into Japan services. Mm. So uh, helping with advice and connections and uh, business matching and things like that. But then um, I think besides those kind of more permanent fixture offerings, there's also a kind of another wave of project-based offerings that the startup cities are doing now. So for example, there's a relatively new initiative to try and attract foreign venture capital firms into Japan. And that is being headed up by Jetro in partnership with three cities, Osaka, Kyoto, and Kobe. We were lucky to win the contract for that. And so we've been working with them on basically finding venture capitalists that match the kind of themes and type of startups that the region has Mm. and bring them across to Japan to give them a taste of A, the potential deal flow they're missing out on by not being in Japan, by not Mm. having feet on the ground here. And then B, what they're missing out on in potential new LPs or investors into their funds from corporate Japan. Yes. 
<laughs> so yes. uh, <laughs> been seeing a lot of VCs all right now it's November 2020 a lot of VCs coming to Japan and I'm assuming they're coming looking for uh, LPs yeah that's happening so I think that's great for everyone involved to go on the tangent on why it's good for foreign VCs to come in I think if anyone is going to influence a startup that is based in Japan to seriously prioritize going global it's going to be those that have invested their money into the company that are already global organizations you could imagine a VC from the US or Europe or Singapore or Israel they were here investing in japanese startups they're going to really naturally help those startups into the markets they are already well connected in and there's a bit more pressure on the founder to listen because they're a key stakeholder after they've invested right so it's kind of like i think a really key missing piece not so much the capital itself but the remit and the purpose of that capital which i think will kind of inject a global strategy into those startups whether they like it or not if they want to accept that money so yeah sorry that was a bit of a tangent <laughs> no that, that was actually really interesting cuz uh i haven't heard too much about that where uh, the cities are trying to let's say attract vcs as well so that was pretty interesting and i also like how you described the startup cities as kind of providing that incubation for both uh, domestic and also foreign startups as well Yeah and I guess we, we that's almost exactly what we're doing to take the example of the Kobe Global Startup Support Program. Mm. So after the Kobe Startup Hub program kind of evolved into this which is more focused on business matching for startups that are serious about doing business in Japan and I think the reason it's very heavy on the business matching focus is you know from a city perspective mm. they want to give you a legitimate reason for spending more time in their city and the best way to do that is to have actual business there outside of the mentoring and outside of any kind of other perks that a program gives if you've got customers in or around that place then that's really the only argument um that you can't go against right uh, i i've kind of come to the same conclusion as well like if the city can't get you corporate clients in their city you're just going to move to tokyo Yeah. I think there is a caveat. So in Kobe's case, they're pretty progressive and forward thinking about the reality of the density of corporates they have versus Tokyo. So they're actually a lot more flexible about helping startups with obviously local partnerships but also partnerships outside of Kobe. Mm. So one of the really cool things for me has been working with them that yeah we're obviously prioritizing Kobe and then after that the wider Kansai which you know if you live here it's people have a morning meeting in Kobe a lunch meeting in Osaka and an afternoon meeting in Kyoto without having to sort of stay overnight anywhere. So beyond Kansai, you know, we we do also reach out to Tokyo and other places in Japan because that's really how business is done here and uh, naturally anyway. So um I think when the city is not Tokyo rather than kind of putting up a wall and ignoring the rest of the ecosystem and potential customers or investors for the startups they're helping. Yeah, I really think Kobe has done a good job at balancing what makes sense for the taxpayers of Kobe, which is prioritizing Kobe where it can, but also by making Kobe more relevant in a way by being realistic and going beyond its walls to sort of make it a more attractive city. No, I think that idea of helping them move outside their walls and kind of getting involved with Kyoto and Osaka because I mean that adds probably another uh 4 million population. Yeah. yeah. I've also been very impressed with Kobe, like just dealing with the staff, so friendly. And yeah. I also have startup friends in the health tech and right. they've said many good things about Kobe. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, they have a relatively young and diverse team of government employees. Most of them have come from corporate backgrounds or, or different kind of backgrounds, which means they aren't sort of career government employees, which <laughs> I guess, depending on who you are, that may come with a particular stigma or expectation. So they, they don't behave like the typical government staff that a lot of corporates might dread, <laughs> a lot of startup founders might might dread working with that's for sure cool no that's really interesting and yeah i think for those like who wants to hear more about the subsidies like we have one episode just on government subsidies i think with amiho tanaka and the various other cities and also josh thanks for connecting us with uh, kobe as well oh yeah no that's a pleasure thank you for uh, highlighting them Thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Japan. In addition to serving as your fine host, I also provide advisory and coaching services to business owners who want to 2x, 5x, and even 10x their business. So stop holding your company and your team and your employees back and let me help you and your company scale. Find more information at scalingyourcompany.com. Now back to the episode. Cool. So next, this is a new topic for me. So I'm really interested in learning about it. But could you tell us more about like the overseas university innovation, R&D, you know, startup departments and entering the Japanese market? Yeah, this is uh, one of our new focuses now as Innovation Dojo Japan. So I guess just like for years, there have been, you know, collaborations between foreign researchers licensing uh, something they've invented to a Japanese company. And then uh, later, you know, the deep tech startups entering Japan, uh, working with corporates or receiving investments from CVCs. What's happening is the universities overseas are realizing that a lot of their, what they would maybe generally called research translation, so like not translated from English to Japanese, but translation from, you know, it's something that's been invented and maybe uh, protected in some way via a patent or IP, intellectual property protection, and translating that into either a, the basis for a startup company or a, a future collaborative research project with an R&D department of a Japanese company, or um, could be the mm. creation of a new spin-out company where part of the technology has been invented, but it doesn't have a company to go with it. So they look mm. for a partner to collaborate and build something around that. It becomes what looks like a startup. All of these kind of avenues They've been happening and they've been happening across border, but there hasn't really been many examples of foreign universities or research institutions saying, you know what, let's actually focus on a particular geography like Japan mm. and put someone on the ground as a full-time representative. And that person becomes the kind of channel back into all of those research capabilities from the researchers of the university. It becomes a channel back into all of the intellectual property on the shelf. So that means, uh, you know, there's years and years of inventions that are just sitting there and maybe they're being used in one market, but they haven't mm. come to Japan yet. And then finally, university affiliated startups. A lot of the um, uh, services and categories that we've spoken about in this episode, incubators, accelerators, startup events and, and communities and all these kind of things. A lot of universities now have all of those things on their campus. And so almost like plugging in a whole ecosystem <laughs> via a, a kind of a representative in Japan, I think going to be the new trend. And, um, and so we're really stoked to be, I think, one of the first to partner with a university. I think I can say it's the University of New South Wales in Australia. And it's um, probably not so well known yet in Japan, but it's the origin of eight tech unicorn companies so far. Oh, wow. So it's probably hitting above what some countries are producing. <laughs> it's always like a big player in Asia Pacific when it comes to entrepreneurship and startups. 
A lot of people who work in tech might know Jira. The, oh, the, yes. Yes, that comes from Atlassian, which yes. the founders come from University of New South Wales. Ah, uh, interesting. So, so there's a bunch of stuff like that that we don't even realize are coming from these kind of universities, right, in some way or another. And so I think, you know, just in the way that maybe embassies exist or mm. trade offices for governments exist, the next wave may be individual universities yeah. having their representatives. And could you just, like, maybe what has been the catalyst is for universities wanting to do this. Yeah. So I think it's generally noticing, just like startups globally have noticed that there is an appetite and a need for foreign technology, cutting edge technology to come into Japan and solve some of the problems which are not able to be solved yet by what's happening already on the ground here. So almost it's a parallel new channel uh, in addition to what sort of cities and corporates are doing with startup sourcing. It's just putting a university kind of brand and channel to bring solutions across the border. So I'll give you a, in this case with the Australian example, back in October last year, there was a, an event hosted at Google HQ in Shibuya called the Australia Japan Innovation Forum. Mm -hmm. and Innovation Dojo were luckily enough asked to manage a business matching style event within that. And the really interesting thing for us was, aside from the Australian startups, there were some university business development managers <laughs> that had flown across and had a booth. And, you know, there were corporates booking time with them, just like they were booking time with startups. And instead of being sort of one startup with a story, it's a university with a portfolio mm -hmm. of research capabilities that they could potentially help jointly do R&D with corporations or existing intellectual property that they could license and give access to or startups that they've been incubating back in Australia or investing in even. And just like any startup in the wild, some of them potentially are going to have a, a value proposition in Japan or a reason to come. So I guess just like a VC has a portfolio, yeah, exactly. a university has a portfolio. So like they have all this talent, all this research, all this IP, yeah. in addition to getting their name more well known as maybe like a research institute so they can further attract good talent. But I guess yeah. through the licensing of IP, maybe creating companies, yeah. they can get some of the value capture. Yeah, exactly. And so that there, there was the University of New South Wales, uh, they did have success at that particular event. And based off the back of that, and some of the existing research partnerships they'd had just from their own business development efforts flying in and out, they see, you know, it's becoming a priority market. And um, I think there's a bit of geopolitics where a lot of universities that had until now been focused on China as their big friend mm. in, in Asia, because of what's been going on, they're now looking for a new big friend. Gotcha. And, and uh, Japan is there. It's, it's a really interesting time, I think, on that. So this has been uh, great. Just to let the audience know, we actually had a list of nine topics today, and uh, we've only covered four of them. But it was really good, actually. I mean, we've only talked for me like 10 minutes before, but I might actually say that among all Westerners, you probably know the most <laughs> about the Japanese startup ecosystem, possibly. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know, I'm, Tyson. I think, I think definitely uh, you're up there uh, yourself. So, <laughs> or Most episodes, I don't learn too much, but no, I've learned quite. It's definitely deep in my knowledge. And uh, hopefully we can get you on again to cover the remaining uh, <laughs> yeah, four to five topics. That'd be great. Um, I'd like that. Thank you. But right before you finish off, do you have any asks for the audience? And um, where can they find you as well? Yeah, sure. So I think I'm probably easiest to find on LinkedIn. So if you jump on LinkedIn and type Joshua Flannery, I'm the one that's in Japan. And besides that, yeah, if, the, if there are any university representatives listening out there or that would be more interested to know about what's happening here and what we're doing with similar universities, please hit me up. And yes, yeah, startups in general too. If you're looking to come into Japan, happy to help you via our Kobe Global Startup Support Program. And yeah. Do you yeah. also help VCs possibly? Because uh, we do have some foreign VCs who listen to the podcast. 
Yeah, definitely. I'm really happy to speak with any VCs that are considering banning into Asia、uh, and Japan among that. So, and even individuals. So, if you're curious as to how someone ends up、uh, living this kind of weird life in Japan with these interesting projects, happy to、um, answer anyone's questions about visual careers too. Thank you so much, Joshua, and hope to get you again. Okay. Thanks so much, Tyson.